on less podcasts. It's actually not bad. It's <laughs> really good, bro. Well Jamie McLaren, back on the Unlaced Podcast. How are you, bro? I'm good, bro. Very good. Um, it's good to be back for the second time around. I know, huh? You were one of the inaugural guests, like in the first five shows. So I love you for that. We love you for that here. So thank you for your support. And to get you back on now, I mean, we just have to because you've had probably one of the most unbelievable years or domestic seasons anyone's had in the A-League. And then topped off by some Socceroo honours towards the end of the season, which we'll get into. Um, for those that have been following you, and I'm sure a lot of people who tune into this show are soccer fans, so they're probably aware of Jamie's achievements this year. But the last two weeks, man, let's just get into that. have probably been the weirdest weeks of your life. Um, and the reason for that is you were in quarantine watching your beloved mm. Melbourne City <laughs> play in the grand final and win the premiership. Man, that was hard. I think... Um... <laughs> I don't want to under talk it, but for me and Curtis Good, who was sitting in hotel quarantine, knowing that we're actually in Australia, you know, we're not overseas, we're in, we're in the country. And, um, you know, we were 30 kilometers away from, from MacArthur when they played them in the semi final. Um, and, and to, I didn't even think of that. You were out there in the same state for the semi. So we missed the semi and the final <laughs> and, and Jakey, honestly, mate, like if you, if you really do think about it, how upsetting it was for us, you know, you work so hard in preseason to then sit there and, you know, it's an honor playing for your country. Don't get me wrong, but, uh, to, you know, you work from day one with, with your club and you set a goal and our goal was to, to win the premiers played. And, and, and thankfully me and Kurt were there for that moment, but the, uh, the grand final, which is, uh, something I've never done before I've played in one and, and, and obviously got beat. So yeah. to watch the boys do it was, um, was definitely a proud moment of myself, but, um, yeah, like I said, it was against a very good team in Sydney and, and we were so nervous uh, going into it. Man, I said this to you off air, like, I'm so glad you guys won because if you didn't, that was going to be the reason why everyone would have turned to, well, our best defender and best player of the season, Curtis Good, and then probably the best player this year and our biggest goal scorer and goal scoring threat aren't in the team. And, and obviously Connor Metcalf too, who's probably starting 11 too. So yeah. Uh, look, Jakey, I, 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 I find, crazy. I find uh, you know, words difficult to say. It's uh, a case of, you know, we would have felt so guilty, you know, we, and we were, we did feel that anyway, you know, mm. leaving our boys go out to battle, so to speak, and um, to, to not be able to be there in a grand final. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, missing the three players and Sydney were missing their three players. And, you know, our, our young boys really stood up and, and I was obviously very proud of them. But um, yeah, at the same time, you work so hard from, from day one with these boys and, and obviously your brothers who, yeah. you know, it's, it's such an honor to, to train with them every single day and see them improve and, and see how's it, how we've grown as a group to then not being able to be in the biggest moment this club's ever had. And um, it was bittersweet, but like I said, me and Kurt had a, a celebratory drink together <laughs> on Zoom, on a Zoom call, downing a bottle of wine, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's gold. Yeah. Oh, mate. So, but why was this time like so badly? Cause this is a one-off, like this would never happen. So my assumption is it was because of COVID. Mm. Yeah. I think the ins and outs of it, we don't fully know. Um, I think Melbourne city, you know, within three months before the season had ended, they did say to, to the leagues, look, obviously there's going to be some soccer who's leaving from all different clubs around the A-League. Um, but final series will coincide with that. And, and what do you want to do? And I think 10 clubs, um, well, I'm led to believe 10 clubs said, uh, no, just keep it how it is. And, and Melbourne city said, well, okay, well you are going to run the risk that you might lose players as well. Cause I think Arnie had spoken to all the clubs and said, you know, I'm keeping track on every single player at, and there's one player in it, at least each club. Yeah. And, um, and the, the, the clubs ran with it. And, uh, you know, we, once the squad was named, look, me and Kurt and Connor were under no illusion. We, we knew that we were going to miss a grand final. Purely because of the, the 14 day quarantine, yeah. um, we, the, the, the dates just didn't add up. Um, and, and you kind of saw the outbreak in Sydney and, and you kind of thinking, you know, you have a little small feeling in your gut, maybe if they delay it by a week, we probably could make it. But even doing two weeks quarantine, you're still not match fit. You know, it yeah. doesn't matter what you do in there. You can ride a bike to Tour yeah. de France, but you're still not going to be match fit. So. Even, even mentally, man, you just must have been staring at the same four walls every day. Like just, yeah. <laughs> You are, you, you, you hundred percent are, you, you can do so many FaceTimes with your family and, and yeah. your missus and, um, it, look, it's difficult, but I, like I said, I'm so proud to, to sit here being a premier and a champion, knowing that, you know, I was involved in, in a championship winning squad with the first time Melbourne's Melbourne city's ever done it. So. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's a, it's a big, it's a big achievement for them and it's been brewing. I mean, the, the squads that they've been building, the culture, obviously the takeover from Manchester city as well. Um, 
for those that that are listening and are like, what are they? What are we talking about? Well, to give to give context, Jamie and a couple of his teammates, Curtis Good and Connor Metcalf from Melbourne City, played all season for Melbourne City, taking them to win the the championship, win the league, and then got into the final series and. Fortunately, we're called up to play for the Socceroos, which is everyone's dream. And obviously that's what you want to do and you have to do. But just due to the circumstances of coronavirus, the boys had to come back and quarantine for two weeks and missed arguably the most two important games of the season, which key players was bittersweet. Um, and I know you are a competitive guy. And I think we spoke as well before of like you, now you're sort of uh, maturing as a footballer and a person you definitely have more of a team first mentality, probably more than you ever used to. Yeah. Um, and as happy as you are for the boys in the club, like it must have still, knowing you, it must have still hurt not being able to like actually have your impact on those moments. Yeah, look, I've, you know, I'm not going to be a liar here and say that <laughs> a couple of years ago, if, if I hadn't scored a ga uh, in a game, I'd be fucking fuming. <laughs> you know, I, I'd be I'd be coming off the pitch and if, the, if we had have won, it would have been a lot better, but it, you know, if you lose games, you kind of take the burden on your shoulders and think, you know, my boys are looking at me. I didn't score today or I missed a few chances. And you know, some games you, you find it hard to sleep at night because you, you miss a, a guilt edge chance or, or yeah. whatever. So, um, to not be, not be around for those, those big things, you kind of, yeah, you miss it, mate. But at the same time, I'm, I'm so proud. And, um, you know, I know that the work and the work that not only me, but Curtis and Connor, we contributed this year. It's, um, it's enough. And I think the boys, um, r really stood up and, and that's, that's what you want. And in this culture, this club has always been, you know, pampered with and saying, people are saying that, you know, they get, they get given everything. Um, you know, they run the league and, and I think, well, you know, don't you want A-League clubs to, to start investing big money and having good training grounds? And you ask every player in the A-League, if, if you want to come to Melbourne city, they would probably say yes. Yeah. I'd be, there'd be very small percentages that would say no, because, yeah. Um, you're given everything as a footballer. Um, that's your dream to wake up every morning and have everything given to you. And all you got to do is tie your laces and yeah. go out there and play. <laughs> so, um, you, we're in a privileged position and, uh, at the same time I'm, I'm get to do it at home. It's the best, best job in the world, man. Um, why were you guys like, you guys were so good this year and like consistently, but not just like getting results. Like you're actually really entertaining to watch. Mm. And I think it was like the, the free flow attacking football, but like you guys were creating chance. It would, it would have been a dream for you in some regards as a striker, but you guys were creating so many chances and it was just exciting to watch. Like why, why did it click so well? What, what made you guys sort of that step up from the league, I guess? Well, firstly, when, when I joined city in, um, in 2019, obviously Warren Joyce, who I knew quite well from my days in England and, um, he brought me over and, and when I first joined the squad was on paper, very, very good. You know, Richie Delat, Bart Shankervel, they've, they've all obviously moved on. Yeah. Dario Vidicic was still playing. So I'm, I'm thinking, you know, this is, this is some squad that can win the league, but we just couldn't get results. And, and the fans were on the back of the coach and, you know, obviously the situation with Bruno and, and, and obviously that all didn't help. But at the same time, I, I'll look at that. And when, when Warren left, um, they employed Eric Monbert, who a French you know, he's mm -hmm. married, uh, PSG, he's managed, you know, Yokohama F Marinos and, uh, he's worked with the French Federation under 21s and it's a huge name. And Proper for character. us, yeah, from, look, from day one, he rocked up in his, you know, nice big jacket and <laughs> he just had an aura about him. And yeah. I was like, Fuck, this, this is, this is big now. We need to, you know, something has to turn. The only way is up because, yeah. you know, we bowed out of the final series last year and, and this was my first sort of preseason going into it. And day one, he was like, balls. We're fucking, we're not, we're not running. We're getting, we're using the balls, you know? And, and that was one of the first times in preseason I've ever had the balls out in, in day one. And we just worked on with mannequins and just worked on structures and, and the way we're going to play and, um, the rotations. And, you know, you could see from preseason, everybody was buying into it. There was no one going their own way. And, and when you've got that, it, it set us up to, to where we are today. But the players that have stuck around this season are only reaping the rewards from last year. So yeah. we wouldn't have been this good this year if we didn't have last year. So yeah. And obviously PK has, has stepped into the role unbelievably, but let's not forget he had Eric who was guiding him and, and PK was sort of the, the translator with, with yeah. sort of the broken English that Eric had. So, um, like I said, last year was so enjoyable, but we've just gone and bettered that. And, and I thought last year we were good, but we've just gone to a whole new level now. And I think that the way we play is exciting and, um, we don't, we don't take the backward step from, from minute one to, to minute 90. Yeah. I feel like for the listeners on that are tuning in, like it's really hard to understand where you guys are at now, how much work and time that, that takes. So what, like, it's, it's quite similar to what Adelaide happened at Adelaide with Gombau, um, when he created this whole philosophy and mantra and then he left and then 
a more came in and it was just kind of the wheels were already rolling. Mm. And obviously you, you make some amendments, but it's kind of similar to what City have. And you guys have just exploded this year. I almost feel like now you're in a position, your team, where if certain players come in and out and you replace them, that the team doesn't break. It's still the same sort of, you know, because it's a, such a well-oiled machine. Well, that's the thing. And if you want to talk about examples, let's say Josh Berlante, fantastic player. We've, we've both played with him. But he left and we were like, how are we going to replace him? Top and then player. Aiden O'Neill comes in and Roston Griffiths, who has played six all his life, who's now being converted into a centre-back, can, can play that role unbelievably. So yeah. you kind of think the players that we're losing and then the players that we're replacing with, so Lockie Wales left, but then Marco Tilio came and you kind of thinking like these boys are starting to buy into and, you know, credit to Petrillo who who does all the signings because mm. you, you, got, you can't just go out there and sign the best players. You've got to sign players that fit fit the mould. And, mm. and, and they have. And um, you come this year and, and you see that, I, I I go out for a game and I think, you know, after 60 minutes, I'm thinking, fuck, our bench is good. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, if, they're gonna, on, if they're yeah. going to make a sub, then I know that, you know, Tilio or Seven Kolakovsky is going to come on and make runs in behind and, and be dangerous yeah. for yeah, me. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. from minute zero to, to minute 90, I know that we're going to be dangerous. And um, it's actually just, you know, going even in the warm up, I'm buzzing about because I know we're just going to play some good football. There's nothing worse than going out there and think, oh, back's against the wall. We're going to park the bus and grind out a draw. Fuck mm. that. We're going for three points every single game. Yeah. You know, yeah. and we're throwing, we're throwing everything at it. Yeah. Are there, are there any, um, because of the amazing talent you guys have, I think you got a really good balance of experience, um, imports, obviously Socceroos and also young players. Are there any young players for you that stand out that you think have got a real bright future? Yeah, there is. There's, there's, there's a lot. And I think, um, you know, obviously when coaches start to say, oh, all these young players, Let's be honest. Coaches ain't going to play young players in their starting eleven. All of them. No, you know, you've no got to way. have experience. And I, I've been in that position as a young player, and I look at the squad and think, oh, well, they're getting on. But at the same time, these are the boys you learn from. Yeah. And like I'm starting to understand that now as I get older. I'm 28 this month, and I think I think I'm starting to fall into that fucking old category. Yeah, now. yeah, a, you are, I'm not, bro. I'm not a young player anymore. I got to start giving guidance. But you know, you need a squad of balance. And like you said, you got to have young foreign players, and you got to have young and obviously older players who can who can help. So. Look, we've got a great balance. Yeah. Um, our foreign players, we've nailed it on the head. Yeah. Um, obviously, Nooney was unbelievable this year. I think the best winger in the league. With most chances created. Um, and there you go. So, yeah. you know, a player like him, to lure him to Australia and to have two, two great seasons, because um, I thought he was good last year, but he, he, like, again, he went to another level this year. Yeah, he's um, a top player. You look at him and you think, he's at 33 years of age. He's so durable. And people think, oh, you know, he's 30. Can he, can he, he plays play? like he's 26. Mate, he's playing every single game. Yeah. And, and if there's times where he comes off and he's, he's not fuming with PK, but he's fuming because he's like, fuck up. He's still got, you know, petrol in the tank, you know? <laughs> and that's the sort of mentality. He's been accustomed to playing 50 games plus in, in, in England for his whole career. Yeah. So to have a guy like him and, and come and really not have it as a holiday, that's what I enjoy. And seeing someone like Nooney who in preseason was an absolute animal. That's awesome. You know, the six minute runs, he was blasting everybody and, and, you know, 21 year olds running past him. And that's what you want from your foreign players. That's the example. Yeah. Huh? You spoke of the, um, celebratory drinks you were having with Kurt over zoom, but I mean, have you come back into the celebration still going for the boys? I imagine that you've come back in and they've obviously saved some of the celebrations when you guys got out. How's that been? Yeah, uh, look, the kitty money's gone. But, uh, <laughs> I've had to uh, dip in my own pocket, but yeah. look. Yeah, the, the boys that, that were here and um, could show up uh, made an appearance on Friday night. And um, it was a nice feeling to just to see the boys um, still up and about and, and celebrating something that, you know, hasn't been done before. So, you know, if there's ever a week to do it, it's this week yeah. to celebrate and, yeah. and, you know, let your hair down. And, and you know, but and I know July is going to be a big sort of off season because the A-League such a such a long time. But yeah. um, you want the boys to enjoy that because... Again, we're going to go for it again next year. Yeah. So you, you want to have to that feeling. You want to have that dressing room feeling, you know, when you're tossing the champagne. And although I missed out on it, I was probably pouring Shiraz over me. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, actually, it was a great <laughs> shot Fox Sports caught of Craig Noon having you on FaceTime, yeah, yeah. running around the ground. I thought that was ace. Mate, you know how many fucking people I called to, to try and FaceTime? No one was answering. <laughs> there was one guy answering. Hanging up. <laughs> oh, they kept hanging up on me. Um, but look, that, that moment for me, honestly seeing the boys and actually just being there and they were, you know, showing me the fans and, um, some of the fans got to see me from like a little glimpse and That's awesome. that, even that was nice, you know? And I think I felt like I was in the moment just for a little bit and, and that was enough for me. You know, I was in the dressing room when there were, when Pico was doing the, the, the talk with the boys and I think I, I could hear everything and that was, was special for me because I don't even think Kurt had that opportunity. So I'm i uh, I've got one up him. Yeah. Good, good. There you go, Kurt. Enjoy that. <laughs> 
But you know what? Even though it was only a small thing, I just thought it said a lot about the culture and the family family feel that the club must have at the moment. It is, and, and that's and that's what I mean. Nooney was was running over to a camera, and, and every single player I actually got to have a chat with, or at least say good luck and yeah, yeah, yeah. before the game, and, and congratulations after the game. So for me, that just shows how much you know. Even they appreciate the work that say me and Kurt and Connor have put in, and um, we're a squad, mate. At the end of the day, this this game ain't individual, and um, you know I feel like we've contributed enough to to really enjoy this success and. Uh, yeah, to, to be there on that moment was, was, was unreal. Did the gaffer in PK, um, utilize you guys from like any sort of motivational stuff before the game leading up, like any video or just any sort of conversation with the team to kind of share your piece? No, we, we didn't have any video, but we, during the, during the week, I spoke to sort of the attackers, um, okay. sent a message to Tills and, and to Collar just to say, look, you know, I know it's a big game. Just don't play the occasion. Just enjoy yourself. There's going to be 15,000 there, probably the biggest crowd you've ever played in, but yeah. Hey, it's, it's going to be a grand final. You've got nothing to lose. Go out there. You're a young player. Um, these are the games you want to play in and, and just play with freedom. So you saw that in the semifinal. I spoke to them before the semifinal and those were the two that uh, really sparked the game in, in the 60th Co- minute. So. I really like Collock. I think yeah. he's a good player, man. He's, he's versatile. You know, yeah. he can play left, right, down the middle. Dangerous. Um, so it, th- these are the sort of players that our club can attract and, and bring through the academy. And um, you know, long may that continue because in the, the day you, you do need to have younger players that are hungry to, to see it. And if there's ever a message to our young 14, 15, 16 year olds, it's like, you know what, there's, you know, 20 year olds that are starting for our team at some point. So yeah, you've got to be ready. Yeah. There's literally now a proven path that like some of those young guys, well, Kolokovsky was playing in that, those age brackets not too long ago. Yeah. And now he's played, you know, he's just won a grand final. Look, you, you got to understand they've got to bide your time as well. You know, we've, we've all been in it, Jakey, you know, you, as a young player, you can't just click your fingers and think you're going to start ahead of, of, ahead of players that have been at world cups or yeah. played in Asian cups, Socceroos. So you've got to bide your time and, and, and write your own journey. So I'm really proud of those two. And I think there'll be many more to come in, in the next few seasons. Yeah. Agreed. Now I want to get on to a bit more of an ind- individual note, um, because this season for me, watching you was like, it was honestly unbelievable. Like Ronaldo and Messi like numbers, which I'm going to get into, but just for you on a personal note across your career, like where does this season rank on an individual level for you? I think from a, from a whole season, you know, after looking at it, um, it's definitely the best, you know, I can't, I can't <clears throat> be better than that or I can't look back and say what, what moments have been better. Um, you know, to have more goals than games is something that, you know, any striker would, you know, be buzzing with. And I think, you know, it, you're always judged on goals. Let's put it frank. You know, yeah. people keep saying, oh, you know, you can add more to your game and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, you're a striker. You you have to, you get paid to put the ball in the fucking back of the net. You don't get paid to, to make tackles or you, you, that's your job. Mm. You know, that's why goalkeepers get paid to save, you know. So I think that, you know, my season to date probably could have had more goals if I'm honest you know the team around me have been fantastic in creating chances and um you know I've set the standard a couple of years ago when I when I scored 20 goals at Brisbane then I did it again at Brisbane and then now I'm kind of hitting the 23s and 25s and you know it's 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 going to be hard to to reach but I look at my squad now I think I can do that again you 100%. know and and, and, the, and the self-belief obviously is always there with me but um you know I work daily I work daily on on individual finishing and uh, making sure that going into games, I left no stone stone unturned. You know, I, I'm working on heading um, different aspects of it because it's it's not as easy as just rolling a ball and taking a touch and hit it. Because in a game, it's not going to come like that. You've yeah. got you've got to be, you know, almost pessimistic and and understand that there's going to be mistakes and you've got to be ready. So, um, yeah, I'd look at my moments. I'd say my best moment in football to date, other than sort of getting picked for a World Cup, would be scoring at at Rangers at yeah, Ibrox, 50,000 yeah. people. We spoke about that. I had a penalty and, yeah. um, you know, John McGinn, who's now Scottish legend. Aston Villa. Yeah. Didn't want to take it. So <laughs> Jesus. So, there you go. I'll do it, Johnny. <laughs> yeah. So he gave me the ball and, and that, that for me, I just somehow just will find it hard on, on a pitch to match that. But look, Melbourne City, um, you know, winning two golden boots in a row and um, keep... Keep scoring goals for this club. You know, now I'm the, the top scorer this club's ever had. And, and you know, you know me, man. I'm a proud Melbourne boy. You know, I, both, looking, we both are. Yeah. You know, so looking at that and I just think, you know, this was something that I've always wanted to do. And um, and I've done that. And, and I just want, I don't want to stop. You know, I want to keep going. And that's a big reason why I'm sticking around, mate. You know, I signed a three-year deal. And, um, you know, the, the, the fans and that will, will see more goals coming from me. Nah, man. It's true. You're, you're leaving a legacy in the city you grew up in. And, and the the city that gave you so much in regards to like your, you know, junior development. And it's pretty special now to see you do it on the professional stage. And, and given, I know you so well, this may seem like a bit of a stupid question, but 25 goals in 24 games, 
the hardest thing to do on a football pitch for me in general and for anyone, I think is to score goals. Why are you so good at scoring goals? <laughs> like, I know it sounds stupid, but like, what do you think? What do you, because you've always scored goals and it's not an easy mm. thing to do, but you've just always had a knack. Well, I didn't get it from my dad. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Donnie. Yeah, he, he, he said, he always, every time I see him, he, he says, mate, you can't fucking dribble. I said, mate, you couldn't, you couldn't even score. What are you talking oh, about? Oh, mate. Look, I, I don't know. I think I've, I've just got a knack and that's, that comes naturally. I think I just, I'm always thinking two or three steps ahead of maybe the other team or the other defenders. I, I don't know. I, I always. Is it mental? Like, is it more it is. mental? Like it's, uh, it's just that sort of battle yeah. of like staying switched on, yeah. taking a chance. The minute, the minute, run. the minute our boys go across the halfway line, I know I'm on yeah. and I've just got to be sort of making my movements and making sure the, the defenders can't see me or, or put myself in an area that I don't go outside of the goal. Cause if I do, then the finish is going to be 10 times harder. Agreed. So um, and sometimes the boys put it right on the spot or sometimes I've got to wait for a mistake. And, um, that, that's why you see strikers around the world. They're consistently scoring goals every single year. And it's not down to them not working. They work every day, but they've just got something within them naturally that that's why you call it a natural goal scorer. And I think that, you know, I actually read a quote by Lukaku the other day and he said, um, Ronaldo, Messi, Lewandowski, he goes, these guys all get quoted about oh how good are they as strikers but when Lukaku scores 30 goals it's all about form yeah yeah but yeah at the end of the day a goal scorer is a goal scorer 100%. and it doesn't change whether you play in the A-League or you play in Europe if you can score goals you'll always sniff out a chance and yeah. that's something that I can do and I've done that since I was you know 12 13 years of age literally um the, yeah so the individual um level you've had this year has been unbelievable and you did get some acknowledgements which I do want to mention not only were, I'm going to say, you know, PFA team of the season and captain, which is a major honor because it's voted by the players. It's voted by your peers. So to get that acknowledgement, that's, that's really big. If you ask me, like the, you're, the people you're versing it are giving you the honor of like, yeah, he was the best this year. Look, other than the championship and the premiership, that's the biggest award you can get, mm. you know, okay. The golden boot and you know, they're, they're, don't get me wrong. They're great. They're great to have. And, um, but to actually be acknowledged by the guys you play against and the guys that they might not even fucking like me or they might, don't, you know, (laughs) I might, I might not have even spoke to them before, or for some reason they're just, you know, they've, I don't know, come across them a few times and some guys may have voted me because they're my mates, but at the same time, (laughs) you know, if you're getting voted by the guys that you're going out to, to verse, it's, um, it's better than any, any award you can, you can give me, you know, and and I know people, and you're probably going to ask about the Johnny Warren award, but you bet I will that, that. Winning that is actually 10 times better than winning any I, sort of Johnny Warren. I honestly movie. agree. Like, yeah, there's more, there's more value on that because I don't know who the fuck picks the Johnny Warren movie, <laughs> and I'm going to get into that, but, um, no, I know no. who picks the PFA team this season and they're the ones that actually, for me, I'm like, I'd be more proud of that. And one of the other awards you did win was the Melbourne city's members player of the year, which I know that again in itself is a pretty big thing because that's like your fans, your supporter base. That's pretty big too. And before you m- do jump on that. People are going to like, oh, he didn't, he did all this, but didn't win Melbourne city player of the year. If there's anyone that Jamie and I would have loved to see Melbourne, uh, win Melbourne city player of the year, it was Curtis good after the year he's had, oh, sorry, not the year he's had the, I guess the five, six years he's had leading into this year that have been really challenging for him. And we both know what a player he is and how good he can be. So I think one for you winning this award would have been great, but two seeing him get that, you must've been pretty happy for him. Yeah. Well, uh, look, members player of the year, I think, these are the guys that pay to come watch you play. And, and it's obviously an honor to win that. But I want to talk about Curtis. And I think people don't actually know the work that he's put in or the shit he's been through to get to where he is today. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think the uh, the people that are close to him and the people that really know Curtis's story, it's actually inspiring. And I think he deserved the Melbourne City Player Award by a country mile. Mm. He was by far the best center back in the league. He deserved his Socceroo call up recall mm. and he got his, he got his, his cap for the Socceroo again. And, um, he was by far unstoppable this year. He's a, he's a brick wall. Um, no one can get past him. Um, and he's just grown and grown and grown. And, um, I, I'm so proud of him, not only because of how he's had this year, but what he's, where he's been and what he's doing now, um, is unbelievable. And, and he fully deserved that award. We have to get him on the podcast. Hey, good luck getting him out of bed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Curtis, we do need to get you on the podcast. So if you're tuning in, which you're probably not because you're sitting on your mum's couch, um, mate, we'd love to have you on. Your story is incredible. And, and just before we move off Kurt, like he could have easily retired with some mm. of the stuff he's been through yeah. from a physical point of view, like the challenge he's had, the surgeries, 
the trips he was making to all parts of the world to see the best people, you know, in their field. So uh, credit to you, Curto. Obviously, Jamie and I played with Curto back when we were 12 years old in 2005. So it's pretty special to see uh, what you did this season. But I can't, I can't get off the individual acknowledgements without talking about the Johnny Warren medal. So for those listening in, Johnny Warren medal is the best player of the year in the A-League, the Brownlow medal equivalent. Jamie McLaren scored 25 goals in 24 games. Just like, let that sink in. In in Australia, no one's ever done that before. No one's really ever scored more goals in games. You see that with Ronaldo and Messi out of a billion players that play across the, the world. Like, it is just unheard of. Um, and then on top of that, the team has won the premiership. Like, they've come first in the league by a country mile. And one, you don't win the Johnny Warren medal, which, come on. Don't even make the top fucking three. Like, that, that, bro, <laughs> what the fuck is going on there? Like, what are they, what you, like, what do you have to do is what, like, what, what do you have to do? Look, you're asking the wrong guy for stuff. I know, but like, I'm saying, I'm not saying this for you to vent. Like I'm venting for you, I think, because like it is absolutely, and I'm not trying to say Ninkovic and Davia didn't have great seasons. Like Davia is a superstar. Ninkovic is arguably one of the best players to have ever played in the A-League. But come on, man. Oh, look, I'll stop you there. I, I think we've already talked about it. The fact that I won or I was, had the most votes in, in the, the peers PFA team of the season, that was enough for me. So, Jakey, I, look, I, Golden Boot's mine. Um, uh, the premiership, the championship's mine. Um, I'll let you vent. But, mate, for me, it's just <laughs> uh, we move on and, um, you know, just it just not motivation for next year because I, I don't go into every season wanting to win the Johnny Warren Award. No, of course you don't. Of course you don't. I think it's more just for me on the outside. It's like it doesn't it doesn't add up, and I have no emotion tied to it because I wasn't playing. But it just it doesn't make sense to me. Um, I'll move on because I do want to start speaking a little bit more about about you and for those that haven't heard the first podcast I had with Jamie. Like I highly recommend you go back and listen to that one because. We talk about mine and Jamie's childhood playing together, some of the, you know, the highs and lows we had. And a lot of people still don't know that Jamie, despite all he's achieving now, didn't get picked in the under 13 state team, didn't get picked in the Australian Institute of Sport and has by far, has he made that sort of a big regret for all those coaches that were associated with those decisions. But when you, um, when you go into like the preseason coming up now and even before games, and I touched on this, like around, like, why are you so good at? scoring because I just want to pick like your mentality and like what you do from a preparation perspective because I know you're a top pro but what 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 what's sort of your method to get you firing like what are the, the things you'll focus on either going into a game or if, for instance now going into pre-season to try and top the season you have do you have your eyes on things that you know you want to work on yeah I, I've always sort of thought the harder you work the luckier you get so you know if you burst your ass for, for 90 minutes you know you might not get the, the the run of the game, but you might get the bounce of the ball and, and it falls to you in, in 90th minute. You don't see me for 89 minutes, but the 90th minute, the I've king of that. The winner. So king of that. for me, I always think the, the harder you work and, and obviously the way we play, we press high and uh, we try and force errors and force mistakes. But um, as much as preseason's a killer, it sets you up. And last year we've had about six preseasons because of the COVID disruptions. So me and Jamo were running on athletics track down in Aberfeldy and we were doing proper runs like I'm talking like almost the fittest we've ever been guaranteed really? guaranteed this is not match fitness this is this is proper like 400 meters in like you know a minute or whatever so we're doing them consist consistently so I just feel like you know the work that you put in sets you up and um it does help when you've got consistent run of games and look mate I, I've had a season where I've been not had not been injured and that that plays a massive part injuries in this game like you know mate it's mm. they they either take you one way or another and mm. I've been so fortunate and that comes back to Melbourne City and the, the facilities that they put out for us. Yeah, of course. If I didn't have these facilities, you might have seen here hammy, hammy tears or you might have seen little things here and there, but they give me everything that I just need to go out there, put my work in, um, go there from nine, get home by three and make sure that everything's, I tick every single box, you know, mm -hmm. before training, after training, and, and you put yourself in the best position forward for, for game time. And um, pre-season, although it's long, um, it sets you up massively and uh, look, I the same time, I'm going to enjoy the next four weeks. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, so you but, should. But in August, it's uh, it's game time, and, and we we go again, and and I look forward to uh, to the six minute runs and 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 all that. I'm sure you know all about that. <laughs> oh, mate, that's um, you know, that's impressive because uh, 
Also, Scott Jamison, have to acknowledge what an unbelievable season he had. I also did, sorry, forget to say when we're speaking about the individual awards, like the biggest honour that you got this year was captain of the Unlaced Podcast A-League team of the season. So I'll somehow get you a trophy so you can put that up next to you. That's better than the Johnny Warren, brother. Because yeah. <laughs> it's voted by me. They're like, wait, why is his three best mates just start? <laughs> no. Um, on, a, on a, like, this is just going to be a bit of an interesting one because I just want to... I'm going to ask you something and I just want you to, what first comes to your mind? Like, what's your feeling? A hundred goals in the A-League. Only two people have done it. That, that's, that's my feeling. You know, it was, uh, when I scored my first one, I thought, fuck man, Archie's 90, Smeltzy's 92. I'm fucking, they're ages away from me. Like I've got a long way to go, but now I'm past them. And you kind of think, well, what's next? And the only guy in front of me is that beast, Barisha. <laughs> yeah. He just keeps coming back He's... every single year, man. And I just keep tracking him down and, um, look, what a striker, what an absolute animal. And, um, in front of goal, he's hungry as ever. And, um, you could, you could say that he's actually part of me. He motivates me because he, Bro. you know, you want to, you want to be like him and you want to be that goal scorer who the team looks at. And, and when he was at victory in, in Brisbane, mate, they looked at him to score goals. And I feel like now, now I'm 27. I kind of think maybe Melbourne city players look at me like, okay, well, you know, Maka, any danger you got to score or what? <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you know what actually the, I think the worst part of, um, for opposition teams about you now going forward, knowing you is Bessar Barisha. <laughs> if, if he wasn't there, well, it's, it's not so bad, but now you've, you know, you've got something to chase and you will chase it. No doubt about it. Cause what is, what is he at? You're on like low, well, I'll say a hundred and something, but he's on what? hundred and I'm on a hundred, 104 and believe Bess is on 141. 141. Unbelievable, Beshar Barisha. Like, oh, can, look, say, can say what you want yeah, about him, but man, 141 goals. That's... Let's firstly put it out there, Bess, you're a machine, mate. So that's um that's phenomenal. And he's like like you now. You can say you're doing it and winning championships. Like he he scored goals and won. Um, but I just wanted to acknowledge that man. Like a hundred goals in the A League. Like who would have thought when we were playing grassroots soccer? I know, mate. I, I, I was the same. I was almost surprised when I was within touching distance of you know becoming the second all time because I knew Bess was so far ahead, but. Um, when I scored my first goal for, for Perth Glory against Melbourne Heart, which is now City, and the defender playing was PK. So, you know, you kind <laughs> of think, crazy. you know, it's like, that was my first goal. And you think, you know, one goal. Who was in, that for Glory? That was for Glory against yeah. Melbourne Heart. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you kind of go, okay, well, 90 goals is a lot of goals. Um, and yeah, I've just continued to stay on my path, believed, um, and yeah, worked on a lot of things and um, had some some great teams and great service along the way. And here I am, mate, 104. It's crazy, man, because we spoke about this last time, and I'll just reiterate it again, but I think I called the last episode who did The Lawnmower Was On Fire. But <laughs> a boy from Sunbury who in the backyard was pretty much somewhat like an 18-yard box, a bit bigger, and a, and a, and a soccer goal, um, which I when, when I went over there as a kid, it was like heaven. It was like Christmas mm. every time because you just turn and shoot and whatever. But a boy from Sunbury that had lawnmowers on fire, Shooting all day, every day, not making state teams or AAS, and you're on track to be the greatest goal scorer domestically that we have. Like that is unbelievable, and I'm sure even your stern old man is giving you a pat on the back for that. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think he is. Um, yeah, like I said, man, I'm just proud to, to obviously to reach the milestone of when I reach 50, then then get to 100, and and you kind of go, okay, what's next? So if you really go off that, you go, you go 150. Um, and, and you kind of say, well, I've signed and I've got another three years left at Melbourne city on my, on my contract. So, you know, if you go 50, I'll try and get 50 in those three years, mm. I'll, I'll aim for that. And I'll, and I'll, you know, secretly set my goals and, and, and work towards them and obviously have good service behind me and, and make sure that I'm ready every single game to, to hit the back of the net. But, um, I, I won't let slide the, the fact that winning a championship is now the standard and, yeah. I, and I want to win a fucking championship every year yeah. and I want to be a part of a grand final next year yeah. and the year after and just keep going and keep building something that this club deserves and that the owners deserve because, yeah. you know, the fans are great and they've been amazing. The ones that have stuck from Melbourne Heart to Melbourne City, you know, hats off to you guys and, yeah. and you've been through the shit and you've been through the great and, um, and now it's kind of a, a bit of a thank you to the owners because you know, they could have easily pulled the pin. Not, not saying, but it does happen in football. Oh, you know? All the time. And, you know, so for these owners to stick the by us, they've stuck by us and they're, they're you know, moving us down to Casey and, and really investing some big money. And um, they see a real, a real prize with us. And, mm. and I think that us as players, it's our due to, to go out there, perform, entertain and, and get three points every single week or, or work to get three points every single week. Correct. Yeah. I mean, it's a business at the end of the day. So to have the people from the business standpoint backing you is always going to give confidence 
um, back into the playing group. Before I jump into the Socceroos setup and, and I guess that, that world of, of Jamie McLaren, probably one question I wanted to ask, and we touched on it a little bit, but particularly if you're a young player, like the advice I think you could give here would be really beneficial because I always found it difficult if I wasn't playing well in a game, it's like how to, how to stay checked in, how to get myself out of a rut, how to, how to get myself out of bad 15, 20, 30 minutes, a bad half, whatever. With you, you've always, like, you were notorious at times if you weren't playing well that you would still pop up and be the difference maker, which don't know if that's just your mentality, but for you, how do you keep yourself in a game when things aren't going your way? Uh, I, I think I might have said it last time, but my little motto daily is, like, just never be satisfied. You know, yeah. and, and training, you know, stay, do extras and put yourself in, in the best position. But with games, um, you know, I used to have, say, I miss a chance and you, you, your body language and stuff like that used to be not the greatest. But now if I miss a chance, I'm like, you know what? Fuck that. I've got teammates around me who will give me the next one. And yeah. if the next one I miss, then it, that's on me. But, yeah. you, you know, you're human. You're going to miss chances. You're not going to score every single chance you get. But you can put yourself in the best position possible. And, and my mentality is if almost... It's it's almost like a tennis player. You know how if they miss a shot or, you know, you don't see Federer sitting there <laughs> on his knees, you know, fucking throwing his hands in the air. Mate, they yeah. move on. Yeah. You've got to move on. Nick um, Kyrgios might though, but no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, it, 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 he's a different breed. But I mean, it's, it, you see those tennis players, how, even golfers. You know, when, yeah. do you, when do you ever see them? Yeah, you, you know, just move on. They just move on. And, and it's sort of, as a striker, and look, strikers and goalkeepers are judged on one thing. And it's different to say midfielders and say fullbacks and maybe wingers who, you know, you're not always having the pressure of having to put the ball in the back of the net or keep yeah. the ball out of the net. Um, and that's just, that's just fact. It's not, a, I'm not trying to twist anything. That's just a fact of, of the game. And, um, you know, I've put my hand up from since I was 13 years of age to be a striker. I moved from right back to the right wing to striker. <laughs> <laughs> so the minute I moved to a striker, I knew I had the pressure and, yeah. and that's something I've always just thrived, thrived. off. And, um, yeah. Soccer camp, man. And the World Cup qualifiers, obviously, we've just been drawn into the third stage of, of the World Cup qualifiers against Japan, Saudi Arabia, Vietnam, Oman, and China. But just jumping back into the camp you just came out of, obviously you were serving the quarantine for it. How, how was that? Yeah, it was, it was good. I mean, it's, it's, it's tough, mate. The conditions probably you couldn't see on TV, but mate, we were training in sandstorms. <laughs> you know, I was doing the warm up with sand in the back of our throat, spitting it out. Oh. Um, and these are the things you're training on, you know, down the back was better at my house. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that though, you man. Know? People don't understand how hard Asia is. They like don't. it's, well, I think, I think I spoke with this with, um, James Troisi and it's like, it's not to down credit the opposition because the opposition in Asia is like really good. They're underrated. A lot of those, a lot of those nations, obviously the Japan and Saudi Arabia's aren't, but all, all competitions are hard, but there is a component there where you are playing the weather. Well, I, I remember the, speaking to one of the guys in Ge when I was in Germany and he said, you know, who are you playing next, uh, next national team? I said, we're playing Saudi Arabia. He said, Saudi, do they even have a team? Oh my God. And then I said, mate, they're, they're fucking good. Trust me. They they're are. actually a very good team. And then Saudi Arabia, what happens in the world cup? They get pumped five nil by Russia. <laughs> and the guys text me saying, yeah, man, they're a good team. <laughs> so that, I mean, that went against me, but uh, look, those teams and those conditions are it's... so, so hard. Look, I would love to see, you know, England going to say Saudi Arabia in, in 45 degree heat. Cause I heard them on fucking the Euros talk Oh, how hot is it at Wembley? 25 degrees. Please. 25 times that by two and then yeah. try and play. Yeah. Come play a game at Perth Glory <laughs> in the, <laughs> in the and middle balls, of summer. Balls bouncing up at Harry Kane's shins. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, that, you know where we'll get a taste of that is the World Cup in Qatar. That'll be the first real sort of like, we'll see how people go with it. Well, the, here, here you go. Why are they having an aircon? Aircon stadiums. Yeah, yeah, I exactly. know. Yeah, that's exactly We haven't right. played in aircon stadiums. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they'll, they'll do that on purpose. <laughs> But so, yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's an honor to, to play for your country, mate, and, and you'll do anything. And, and what I will say is it was actually great that we had four games in the space of 12 days. Yeah. Um, normally you just go and play two and, and you come home. So you normally play, you might play one and come off the bench or mate, yeah. you, you always make an appearance, but to actually be there for four games was actually, um, was, it was really good. And, and to see a lot of the boys after two years, man, that we haven't seen these boys since yeah. 20, 2019. Wow. So, um, and even for me, I missed the, the actual last camp in Jordan because I tore my hammy. So even before that, I haven't been involved with Socceroos for, for over two years. So it was nice to be back and um, to see all the familiar faces and, and put on that shirt, mate. You can't beat it. Bloody oath. So this next stage of the World Cup qualifiers, is this the last last phase? Yep. So top two of the group, 
will go in or is it, how does it, how does it work? Yeah. Uh, look, they were talking about restructuring it, but I think it's still top two and then the best third place will face a, um, oh, oh, South, South American, American team. I think that's still the, the format they're going with. Yep. 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 Um, but yeah, it look last year, the last time the Socceroos did that, they went through Honduras. So yeah. Okay. Um, what's your, what's your first sort of take on the group? It's a mixed bag, isn't it? Like, yeah. it, you know, Japan, top quality. We always get Japan. Always. Yeah. We, we seem to always get Japan, but look, don't, don't you want to play the best? True. You know, you, you always want to see where you're at and, um, and yeah, we've got Saudi Arabia, so it'll be good to go in sandstorm again. Um, <laughs> and then you got, um, Vietnam, Oman and China. Yeah. Look, going to China will be interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, to see what, how everything's panned out and China as a nation now, you, you do hear of things where they're naturalizing Brazilians, they're, you know, their, their coaches are all foreign. So, you know, you're going to see, I don't know, um, what's his name? The striker for Elkison. He plays for China now. Oh, does he? He's, he's been there for five or six years. And so he's a citizen. Yeah. So I think they're doing a lot, a lot of that now. And, um, they've invested heaps of money into their academies. So Chinese players will, will only get better. And, um, the soccer who's played them in the last Asian cup, but it'll be interesting to see how they go now. And, uh, Oman, we've played them before we beat them, um, comfortably in Dubai and, uh, and Vietnam, the unknown. I've, I've played them at Oliru level, um, and they're they're fit, they're quick, they're nippy, and um, they are. Yeah, it's just yeah, and they're hungry, mate. They they flying for challenges, and um, it's just I, I'm more interested to see how the how it's going to be, where our home games are going to be, yeah. you know, because look, we're we're so strong at home, you know, yeah, regardless of, of the golden generation, the Socceroos, the generation that Ange had, uh, Ani's generation. Now it's like every single camp that Socceroos have at home, they always win. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see. And I hope, look, you never want to put sort of the health at risk, but we need to start having soccer games at home because yeah, it's going to be, course. it's going to be hard for, for boys not to, to play in front of their home fans and, and, and the Australian public deserve it. It's important, man. It's important for our game and like the people, that's what connected, that's what connected us to the sport was going to watch the soccer and yeah. like, you know, has packing up their home stadiums for these games. Yeah. Um, Speaking of like, and, and one thing just on this as well, it's become a little bit normalized for Socceroos to win in Asia and also qualify for world cups, but it's not to undermine, like it is really hard, really hard. Like it's, it's home and away legs in, in these countries, as you said, the home fixtures, we are still in doubt of like how that's going to look. It's, it's a really hard thing to do. So, um, it will be amazing that, that if we can get there, given obviously the last few years, and as you mentioned, the camps have been kind of split up, but. I'm interested to know just around the group that you touched on in Arnie's generation, somewhat a relatively new group, like a relatively young team forming, or at least some inexperienced soccer a lot of debutants in the past few camps. Um, how, how, how's that been for you? What's it, what's it been like sort of seeing that all come together? Yeah, good. And I think there's a lot more players that had their hand up to for selection. I think we've got a big group of players that could easily be selected. Um, and it's, it's nice to see some of the familiar faces and the boys that obviously guys like Matty Ryan, Trent, the, the, the custodians, if you want to call them and, mm. um, that have been around for so long and played over 50 games for their country, which is, which is huge. And, Mental. Uh, and then you've got guys who we know like Jackson Irvine, who, um, you know, he's got 30 odd caps now and, and, and Milos and these players are guys that we play with in the Oli Roos oh, and how they've, crazy. they've, they've doubled sort of my appearances for Zocaroos. They've just been unreal in the last two or three years. So, um, the squad's good. It's got a good, a good balance. Um, I think. Arnie, now that he's in charge of the Oli Roos as well, he's starting to integrate some of those boys and, and Connor, Connor Metcalf fully deserved his call up and, mm. and got his soccer appearance. And I think he got two caps now. So awesome. a player like him fully deserves that. He's been, he's gone from, since I joined, he's gone from a boy to a man. And I've mental. seen that growth. That's mental. And I think it's, it's actually good to, for other players to see how quickly you can go from not even a starter at Melbourne City to actually a starting a game for the soccer Roos. Mental. So yeah, th there's a lot of players that you, you do need to build that experience. You don't just, and I don't want to take it lightly, but you don't just get picked for soccer. You've got to earn that call up for Socceroos. Like every time I've been picked, mate, I've, I've had to earn that. I've had to score over 20 goals. Like my first Socceroo cap, mate, I had to score 35 A-League goals to, to even be, to even <laughs> yeah. be considered. Yeah. You know, so I had to, I had to grind through that to get, be selected, but I'm not saying that players are just given caps here and there, but you've, they've actually worked for it. And when they first get their appearance, you would think, okay, they look back and they say, all the work was worth it. Yeah. You know what? Arnie said something on this, I think, when uh, Ruan Tongit got picked up uh, or got selected for the Socceroos. He said something, and I hope I get this right, but it was like something like there's only been 600 people that have played for the Socceroos True. in the history of, in a hundred years. Well, I'm, I'm 584. So that just shows like how, 
you know, how rare it is, how, how special it is when you think of that in a hundred years, only 600 people have played for their country at the highest level in this country in football, which is, you know, you hear people playing 50 caps, 30 caps, scoring goals. Like it's just an unbelievable, unbelievable achievement. And for the average Joe like me and, and for the listeners out there, can you like, what, what are the Socceroos camps like? Like, what is it actually like day to day for you? Oh, uh, look, you, you wake up, you have breakfast, you do your wellness, you go in there, weigh yourself. Is it very um, regimented, like a lot of sort of structure? And... Oh, heaps. I mean, now was a bit sort of overkill with the COVID situation. Mm. Um, you know, masks everywhere and, you know, we, we had to do it. It's it's part of it. But normally it's just, you know, wake up, have breakfast, say hello to the squad, the squad and the staff and um, and then you chill. It, the problem is with Socceroo camps is because you're in playing in those countries, you actually don't train till like 7 p.m. at night because so you can't train. To, you can't train, you know, so... You end up just sitting on your bed and chatting shit with the boys or you know, <laughs> sitting in the, in the social room, having a coffee, playing PlayStation and you kind of kill time like that. But, um, yeah, there's the standard lunch times and, and all that, but, and meetings and, and stuff, but, um, it, it's more just nice to, to hear other boys stories. You know, some, some boys, even for me, I, I was in negotiation with Melbourne city at the time. So you're kind of talking with the other lads. Okay. You know, yeah, oh, yeah. they're saying I've got an offer from them and, and it's nice to talk about other boys journeys. So yeah. I think that's something that, that sticks by. And, and obviously you find out guys like Brad Smith who, you know, he's living in America now. I just wanted to see how he's going. And, um, yeah, it's, it's nice to catch up with him. And, um, it's like, it's like you haven't been away cause you have that bond for a very long time. Is it, a, is it a little bit surreal that like some of the teammates now you're playing with in the soccer you were playing with as a kid and like, you just look at each other and like, we're, we're all here in the same environment, like the most elite level we can. Just it honestly just makes you feel old. I yeah. think, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, from, I remember under 12s, you know, me, you, Jacko, Curtis. There's a, there's a photo, I was saying, there's a photo of the under 12 Victorian primary school state team. It's the first possible state team we could make. I mean, I was in there, but like, let's be real. Jackson Irvine, Curtis Good and Jamie. There's a photo of three 11 year olds playing in the same team who are all now playing for the I'll just say, Curtis was up front. I was at right back. Yeah. How funny how things yeah, yeah, have changed. Yeah, yeah, huh? yeah, 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 that's right. For good cause as well. Imagine putting, imagine putting Curtis up front now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hold up, striker. <laughs> oh, God. But it's pretty special, man. Like, I just think, because like, even for me, like from the outside playing with some of you guys, and there's obviously a lot of players that we played at a, at a young age who weren't from Victoria, but across like the state teams and stuff like that, that you just link up with now. And it's like, it just, it's weird because you, you've known them your whole life. You know yeah, I mean? it's, it's all that saying of, you know, the, the small percentages make it and, um, and, and that, that's true. You know, you've, we've seen it, mate. We've, we've had to grind and, uh, and get to the highest level possibly in Australia, but, uh, the old saying is what cream rises to the top. And if mm. you continue to, to grow and improve and, and want to be hungry to, to succeed in this game, then you'll always get there. And I think the minute you play a professional game in the A-League, you can kind of say you've made it because you've reached the, the highest point in, in, in Australia. Yeah. On the earth. Moving back to. Melbourne city and, and Melbourne, obviously your beloved home, home state or ours, I should say. Um, you mentioned you were doing, you were in negotiations whilst you were away on Socceroo camp. Um, you confirmed two year extension with the club a couple of weeks ago now, which was pretty good timing. I would have thought leading into the final series for some of the boys, it would have been a real mm -hmm. boost seeing that like the, the spearhead sticking around. So this is, this is what this is about. But, um, I guess for you, what, like, cause there would be people from the outside that would say, well, you've done so much here already. You're at, you're at an age where maybe you could come, go back overseas, back to Europe, the Middle East or whatever. What, what sort of gave you the clarity to stay? Yeah, there, there was mixed reviews and, or whatever you want to call it. I think a lot of people had, had their opinion and, and, and that's fine. But at the same time, you know, I look at my career to date with Melbourne city and my games and goals and how many minutes I've played, you know, it's a short career, mate. Mm. I think, you know, when you look at when you retire, you kind of think, okay, how many games have I played or, you know, and I, I right now I've, I've had one injury at this club. Um, I'm enjoying my football. I'm playing every single week. Um, we're successful. It's a great club. I'm back home in Melbourne. Um, it actually was an easier decision than people think, you know, yeah. there, there, there was interest, mate. There always is with players. There's always talk. And, you know, my agent sort of said that there's this and possible and there might be this, but what people need to understand is when you're, when you're under contract, someone has to buy you. Mm -hmm. So if a club wants to buy me, it doesn't just, just because I accept it doesn't mean Melbourne city accept it. Mm. So Melbourne city, if, if they've ever, ever had an offer, if they've declined it, then that's, that's really on them. If they have come to me and said, look, Jamie, we, we're actually keen to keep you for another couple more years till 2024. Would you be interested? Mate, th that's almost music to your ears because mm. you kind of think, well, I'm loving my football here. I'm loving, if you're happy on the field, you're happy off it and vice, vice versa. versa. So yeah. I kind of think, well, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to stay. And if, 
someone wanted to buy you, they'll, they'll still buy you under contract. So yeah. regardless, I just want to know in terms of security, but not just that. I want to know that I want to build something at this club and not, I, I said it in, a, in, in an interview a couple of weeks ago before it got announced. I actually want to be a Melbourne City legend. Like mm. I want to be the person that, you know, when, when you think of Melbourne City, you think, okay, well, it's Jamie McLaren or, mm. you know, well, I am the top scorer for this club's ever had, but I want to, I want the next fucking number nine to come to this club and go, oh, wow, I've got over 80 it's goals. like to similar catch. to Archie at Victory in a sense, right? Like I've got, sort of I, yeah, I want them to be like, I've got to catch this guy. Like yeah. that's, that's kind of the, the legacy that I want to have. And, you know, knowing that, you know, let's be honest, I'm going to retire in Melbourne. I'm going to live in Melbourne. So, you know, I'm going to have my family around me and, and knowing that, um, I've created something at this club and I want to keep continuing to, to, to be at this football club. So, um, they've given me so much as well. Right. So it's almost like for me to, to walk out the door, um, would have been not right at the same point, but I, I still feel as if I have more to give for this club. And, mm. um, it's a great relationship we've got going, you know, a, a great, a great squad. I love working under PK. Um, and, and the staff, the admin staff and, and, and from the CEO and even from Brian Marwood and Simon Pierce who have backed me from day one, you know, they didn't have to, um, you know, I was, I was playing in Scotland on loan f- in, from Germany and, yeah. um, playing, not, is, not that, playing as a number eight. <laughs> yeah. I mean, not that they threw me a lifeline, but they threw me an opportunity to come home and, yeah. and really show. And, and I knew I was going to do it. You know, if someone said to me, you, you're going to have 53 goals and 58 games, you're going to do that. I would have said yes, yeah. but you got to go out and prove that. So, and I've done that and, um, it's nice to be rewarded from, from city, um, to, to be handed with a new long-term deal. And, um, yeah, I can't wait for, for next season to start and, and years to come. It's possibly the, the greatest answer we've ever had on this podcast. That was, uh, phenomenal. And I really do believe actually, like, I know when you speak it, you believe it and I can feel that. So I'm super excited. And obviously the project it excited you enough to commit long-term, um, for you, across these sort of next two, three years, like what is it that you would really want to achieve, like to maximize, like if you look back in three years and what are the boxes you want to have ticked? Well, yeah, to be honest, when I first joined, I was like, this club needs to win something. You know, I was playing for Brisbane Raw when they won the FFA cup and hadn't won anything since. And last year got to a grand final within touching distance of that. And, um, this year we've just been a completely whole new beast. And I feel as if Let's continue to roll on that. Let's add a few more faces because that's what happens in football. You know, you're going to lose some, you're going to gain some. And um, I want to keep building. I want to keep driving. The new players that come, you know, guys like myself, Roston Griffiths, Jam- obviously Jamo, the captain, mm-hmm. who who it all comes down from him. But we want to drive the new players who haven't experienced what the Melbourne City standard is like to actually say, listen, we want to win something. We, we, just because we won last year, th- we go again. Yeah. So I, I want to be a part of that and I want to next year do it again. But that just doesn't come by clicking your fingers. Yeah. I, I've seen that, you know, I saw that at the start of this year, we were in a grand final last year and we lost three on the trot this year. Yeah. And I, and I thought we were at, at a stage in, in that, in that season where we were just like, ah, we'll just turn up and win. But now you got to fuck it. You got to work to win. Yeah. And, and that's something that PK has driven from up, driven into us. And that's something that, you know, we'll know that it's probably put us in good stead that, to know that next season, every single game you've got to be on. Yeah. Jamie McLaren been a pleasure my friend you know i love you um i love having you on this show it's the second time we've had you on am i the, def- am, am I the only person that's been on twice johnny mccain did make a cameo okay, twice. I'll, I'll let you off johnny mccain's a great guy and you've known him for a long time but um yes you well v- 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 exclusive episodes no you're the only one that's been on twice johnny was part of the a-league season review overview which was you know three people so it's not going to be your last either we love you on this I'm show on for the hat trick mate yeah you're going <laughs> the hat trick we'll, we'll always time it well but i just want to thank you man obviously want to acknowledge the year you've had, as we said, 25 goals, 24 games, 100 goals in the A-League, championships, the double. I mean, it is literally the perfect season, but it does not just get gifted to you. That comes with tremendous amount of effort and hard work. And I know if there's anyone that's going to back it up and not let that get to their head, it's probably you. So um, thanks, brother. excited for next year, bro. Yeah, I can't wait. Um, obviously, thanks for having me on. And I hope next year when we uh, we chat again, it's... It's a three-peat. And, yeah. and may, maybe the Johnny Warren Award. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, man. Honestly, I'm going to make a fake Johnny Warren and wear it on our next one. It's, oh, <laughs> oh, God. Quality. Oh, pleasure, bro. Thank you again. No worries, bro. Thank you. Done.